<laughs> okay. Welcome to Seattle, Andrew. Um, Thank thanks you. for joining us here. Um, so first of all, congrats on your new book. I know this isn't your first rodeo. Um, this is book number four for you. Is that yeah, right? yeah. Um, but so it's, a, of course, an accomplishment to get one of these out the door. And this just went onto the shelves on Tuesday. Fantastic. So we're excited to have you here um, so soon after its release. And um, as the video was pointing out there, this book has a pretty ambitious title. Um, so uh, Why ambitious? Because you're going to tell us in, in a 270-page in a uh, book how, how to fix the future. I don't think that's ambitious. <laughs> okay. Well, I, I appreciate your ambition. So I guess um, the, the perhaps naive question uh, that you still probably get asked a lot is, is, is the future actually broken? And, and how so? Um, well, the idea of, actually the title came from, Jaron Lanier famously said, although he actually denies he said it because he wrote it, so it's hard for him to deny, but he said he misses the future, which I like that idea, you know, the idea of looking forward to the future, of romanticizing the future. So uh, uh, maybe not the, f the future is broken, but the, the mythology around the future has been, um, the romance of the future has been corroded by what's happening, particularly in tech, but broadly. So we're living in increasingly pessimistic times, I think, um, a time where we're not looking forward to the future, where we've given up m much of the optimism associated, particularly mm -hmm. in terms of my work and this book, with the promise of technology. Over the last 25 or 30 years, many people have written, most of you probably read these kinds of books, many people have written books and spoken about the promise of technology, particularly the internet, that it was supposed to democratize, it was supposed to create more jobs, it was supposed to empower and give all sorts of different people a voice. And whilst some of that is clearly true, I mean, you can't deny that, um, 25 years later and we're, you know, the five largest companies, most valuable companies in the world, almost with the power and the wealth of small states, are all tech companies. And we have a winner-take-all economy, we have the corrosion of our culture by fake news, and the sort of racism and uh, other sort of hatred on social media. Uh, we have an imminent crisis of joblessness because of smart machines. We have what I call, although it's not my term, surveillance capitalism, the business model of companies like Google and Facebook, which have transformed us into products. Uh, so uh, the future certainly isn't as promising as it once was. And uh, the purpose of my book, and I think increasingly the discussion around tech now, is how we're going to fix it. Because many people believed in it, and most of those believers have stopped believing in it. Um, and some of them are in the book. Do we need to, so here in Seattle, um, and, and where you're from in the, the Bay Area, um, I, I wonder is that, do you find that that's a harder sell? I mean, here we are in a place where, you know, Amazon's hiring a, a thousand people uh, every few months, and uh, Bill Gates has started the, the world's largest charity here, and, and in theory, at least on paper, we should be benefiting from, from this vast explosion. Well, you are. I mean, I'd rather live in Seattle than, uh, you know, Kansas City. Mm -hmm. um, or uh, Birmingham, Alabama. Um, I mean, you can benefit from the wealth and benefit from the dynamism and at the same time be critical. I mean, I'm an example of that. I'm a tech entrepreneur. I might be living one way or the other through tech, either promoting events around it. Uh, I'm also an advisor on tech companies and sometimes criticizing it, but there's no reason why you can't also be critical. I think Seattle, and I was just in Portland yesterday, you have traditions of political radicalism or certainly more progressive political tradition which looks critically at some of this stuff. I think Bay Area is slightly different. Particularly San Francisco has been culturally decimated by tech. I think the Bay Area is increasingly um, uh, uh, sort of a culturally, I mean obviously you've got the tech and Silicon Valley and Palo Alto and all that. But I think it's lost its soul. I think technology has destroyed the soul of the Bay Area and San Francisco in particular. It's become so expensive and so dominated by tech millionaires and wannabe millionaires that uh, it's, it's, a, it's a rather sad place now. Um, 
maybe something will happen. As always with San Francisco, it will surprise us. Maybe there'll be a massive earthquake and all these people will get killed or something. But uh, <laughs> certainly something has to happen because the spirit of San Francisco has been, um, has been appropriated, if that's the right word, by by Silicon Valley. I definitely think you'd hear some people say the same thing. Yeah, I mean, Seattle obviously, real estate prices and all the rest of it. I mean, all these, I mean, this, the role of the city in tech is very interesting, I think. Um, you know, I have an interview show on TechCrunch, and I talk to a lot of people about local power and the role of cities in revitalizing civic culture. Um, I think the cities have an increasingly important role to play, actually. And I think at the local level, when it comes to digital technology, much of the initiative is coming at the local level. I did an interview with Gina Raimondo, the governor of Rhode Island, and one of the chapters in the book is about Estonia, and she told me she was very inspired by what's happening in Estonia. Mm -hmm. I mean, obviously, the American government, for one reason or other, the federal government is completely paralyzed. It's sclerotic. It doesn't work. The political system in this country is in deep malaise. Uh, but that doesn't, uh, the central system, but that doesn't mean at the local level. So I wouldn't give up on cities. I mean, obviously, real estate prices and traffic and all the other things that we live with on a daily basis. But I think, at least on, on a political level, the reforms are going to come locally rather than nationally. And I'm from progressive places like Portland, Seattle. Uh, I have some stuff about Oakland in the book. Mm -hmm. Los Angeles, I think Los Angeles is a much more vibrant, intellectually, culturally, and politically, a much more vibrant place than San Francisco. I mean, I live in San Francisco. I live in that area. So, so back when you started, uh, you know, you, you founded a tech startup yourself in the mm. mid-90s. Um, and I think in that time, up until even a, a few years ago, probably, there was a sense that, um, you know, the internet was going to save us. And these companies were, there was a sort of idealistic projection of, of mm. these companies being the future and um, solving all of our problems. Um, why, why do you think that's gone away? Well, I don't think it's gone away. I think that a lot of people are now, I mean, the point of my book is to show that it hasn't gone away. The point of my book is to show that there's a lot of new thinking. I travel around the world. I, uh, it may not be as pronounced in Silicon Valley as it was, and certainly Silicon Valley isn't the center of this anymore. But you have a lot of really innovative, exciting work being done in the, the building of new companies, new ideas of the network. I have a chapter in Berlin, I have a chapter in Estonia, something in Singapore, in India, in Oakland, so it hasn't gone away. What has happened, though, in Silicon Valley is that history has kind of repeated itself. And this is an appropriate message. I, I gave a speech at Microsoft at lunchtime and uh, it happened in the late 90s. You had a winner-take-all tech economy back then, which was smaller than it is now, and one single company had really attempted to destroy innovation. In retrospect, it was, some of it was done illegally, and it was undermined by government, which enabled the burst of innovation of Web 2.0. But we're back now with that kind of winner-take-all economy, with the Facebooks, the Amazons, the Googles, the Microsofts, um, apples, of course, and we need a new burst of innovation. And as I show in the book, everybody wants that innovation outside the big companies. Uh, venture capitalists are as frustrated as anyone, entrepreneurs, regulators. I spend a, a chapter in conversation with this woman called Margaret Vestager, who is the EU Commissioner of Antitrust. And she believes that regulation and innovation, and I think she's absolutely right, regulation and innovation go together. So what we're having in Silicon Valley, which had been founded on this sort of mythology, and some of it true, of innovation and disruption, uh, th these companies have become incredibly conservative. They're protecting their own business models and their own interests. But that's in the nature of things. When companies become huge, whether it's Amazon or Microsoft or Google or Facebook or Apple, they, by definition, become conservative. So we need a new revolution, and part of this book is about uh, the kind of ideas that can foster that. So, you know, maybe new technologies like blockchain are interesting in this sense. So before we move on to some of those solutions, um, I just want to ask, you know, I, I consider myself like a, a savvy consumer, and I'm, I'm smart enough to, to know not to trust Exxon um, or even Uber, companies that have had these sort of big, large-scale 
crises um, or, or you know, public relations crises. Um, but some of the other ones, you know, I use Google, free Google products every day and, and feel great about it. And when I use Airbnb, I feel like, you know, they're really helping me out kind of. So, so these companies seem to have, that, that you're saying are, are really cornering the market and, and maybe have some unsavory practices going on, um, seem to have done a really good job of branding themselves and, and earning our trust and making us feel like we're getting something for nothing. Well, so I don't think, you know, to be, to be um, you know, you, you announced you're a savvy consumer and you say you <laughs> use Google products happily, free Google products. I mean, you don't have any, you don't have any feeling of unease that you're becoming the product. Not that there's a little nosy perker at Google who's looking at all your emails. Obviously, that's not the case. But aren't you troubled by the fact that you, you become the product, that Google is profiting massively from you and you're not seeing any of that revenue? You don't sound a savvy consumer to me. Maybe not. Tell us more about that, how, how, that's, how that's happening, because I don't think that's something that people are, are aware of necessarily when they... Well, I mean, how, who here uses Google? Right, everybody. And who here uses it, you know, every hour? I use it every minute. Um, how do they make their money, Google? We all know that they're the most, you know, amongst the two or three most profitable companies in the world. They make their money through the sale of advertising. 97% of their revenue is advertising derived. And the reason why they're such a remarkable advertising company is because they can pinpoint their advertising because every time we use Google, they learn more and more about us. That doesn't make them a surveillance big brother. It doesn't mean that they want to destroy our privacy. But they are profiting from our personal data. They, have dis they discovered the holy grail of creating a media product that we created. The intelligence in the Google search engine is ours. The original, the miracle of Google, it was a brilliant, brilliant uh, heist, really, if you think of what happened in 1997, 1998. What Larry Brin and Sergey, uh, Larry Page and Sergey Brin did in 97, 98, they were both a couple of brilliant grad students, computer science grad students at, at, uh, at Stanford. They downloaded the entire, they, they, kind of appropriated brilliantly again. You have to admire them as entrepreneurs for their chutzpah. They download, they, they use Stanford computers to download the entire internet, which you could do in 97, 98. You couldn't do that now. And they essentially collated our collective intelligence and created a brilliant, brilliant search engine. So they created a media product whose logic, whose intelligence was built on our behavior on the internet, on uh, websites, um, uh, on the links in websites, and they, they didn't have to pay journalists like you, or maybe that's why you're an ex-journalist, ex-journalists like you. Um, but uh, everybody knows that the, the massive profit of this is derived from the fact that they're not paying the people who are creating the product. And not only are they not paying those people, they are essentially appropriating our data without us really understanding it. If there was someone from Google here, they would tell us, well, we're not really doing it. But no one can really quite understand what they are doing, just as no one knows what the, 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 the recipe is for Coca-Cola or Kentucky Fried Chicken. That's their secret, which they'll never give away. Uh, and Facebook have done exactly the same thing. Facebook's even cleverer in the sense that they appealed to our narcissism, our vanity, our ego, which is infinite in, in early 21st century America. Uh, they said, oh, we'll give you platforms to express yourself so you can connect and put all your photographs up or Instagram or, or Snapchat or any of these other things. And then they acquired our data. They know more and more about us and they sell advertising around that. Now that is, in my view, a bad deal for consumers. And I think eventually, even savvy consumers like you will wake up to that. Uh, in the book, I have an example of the automobile industry. In the 1950s, the American automobile industry was globally dominant. There was very little competition elsewhere from Germany or Japan. And they got really cocky, the American car manufacturers, and start, started essentially to design, became so obsessed with designing sexy products that they became essentially coffins on wheels. Uh, Ralph Nader, of course, in 1965, wrote a famous book called Unsafe at Any Speed. The American 
car industry was exposed for its really un, un, uh, unsafe products, products which didn't benefit the consumer, and the American car industry collapsed, uh, and it still really hasn't recovered. Maybe Tesla will, re will change it, but that's a very disruptive product too. I think the same thing will happen with, with Google and Facebook, and uh, the surveillance capitalist business model is people will eventually wake up. It may take an Exxon Valdez, a, a Chernobyl, or some other big data catastrophe to really shake people up. But I think that's the case. You brought up Airbnb and Uber. Um, I've that, those are good products. I mean, they're great from a consumer's point of view. At least people are being paid, although with the, the problem is how they're being paid. So one of the other things I address in the book um, is uh, how we need to architect a kind of sharing economy in which the, what I call the precariat as opposed to the proletariat, the precariat being the workers of our new precarious economy, the Uber drivers, the Airbnb renters, the people who work on Task Rabbit, they have the protection, they're properly represented. The real opportunity though is not to do away with the technology, the real opportunity is to take away these central powers that are essentially become rentiers. They're taking all the profit off the table. Look at YouTube. YouTube got into the, vi the video business very early. Again, a brilliant play. A couple of, of guys, ex-PayPal um, ex guys, uh, in about 1994, realized that video was the next big thing, and that we were finally ready for it because there was broadband. So they created YouTube. The YouTube business model is essentially, um, again, data, selling advertising, but also paying the content creators on, on, on YouTube pennies. 30% of the revenue from the advertising they take for themselves. The real opportunity are creating, and, and I write about this in the book, really decentralized networks where you as a video consumer and me as a, as a video creator can meet and where we can establish a kind of economic arrangement. So what we need and what I've written about in the book is a new movement to what Tim Berners-Lee calls re-decentralization. The original decentralization didn't work, so we need to re-decentralize, partially through technology, new technologies maybe like blockchain, partially through innovation, and partially also perhaps through regulation. We need people like Margaret Vestager and local state uh, governors and, and other legal institutions to try and enforce new structures which actually promote companies, products, services, which benefit both consumers and producers rather than just only producers. And I look back at the Industrial Revolution, this is a very historical book, and said, look, in the Industrial Revolution you had the same problem. You had the early advantages of monopolists and people producing addictive, destructive products. Today, again, the Industrial Revolution is certainly not ideal. We know of the environmental catastrophes, but the products in food, for example, are much more healthy now because consumers have demanded them and regulators have enforced standards that haven't allowed people to sell really bad products. So it's a combination. You know, in the book, I have these five ideas of saying we always fix our future. We have the same tools, regulation, innovation, consumer activism, citizen engagement and education. It's the same historically always. So as you outlined a lot of those solutions in the book, um, it seemed like most of them were, were thriving the most, or a lot of them were thriving geographically really far away from the, the big tech centers in, in Seattle and, and New York and obviously the Silicon Valley. Um, is there any hope of us bringing that kind of regulation here or it positively influencing us? Um, well, I wrote, I. I decided to write a global book, because most books about technology are centered in Silicon Valley, even mm -hmm. the internet's not the answer, began and ended in Silicon Valley. It was a kind of critique of Silicon Valley, but it nonetheless put Silicon Valley at the heart of the world. I'm convinced that Silicon Valley is, in many ways, no longer the heart. We have what one writer called the splinternet. So the internet is, is breaking up, is fragmented into different markets. Now, some people in Silicon Valley bemoan that, some internationalists bemoan it, but I think most of the kind of globalism inherent in 
the digital marketplace, particularly in these big companies, was simply an excuse to control world markets. There was no real commitment to internationalism or cooperation or uh, cultural understanding. It was just to dominate markets. So I think it's a good thing that we have this fragmentation. I'm, I'm not an apologist for certainly the system in Russia where Putin has created a kind of troll state in which he finances trolls to undermine our democracy. I'm very critical in the book of what's happening in China with the creation of a kind of digital Orwellianism, a digital big brother where everything is known and every, everyone is rewarded for their political correctness. But there are many other parts of the world where you have really great innovation. I'm in Estonia, I have a chapter in Estonia which is a kind of utopia. I use the theme and the metaphor of utopia a lot in the book. Singapore is the same. A lot of interesting stuff going on in Germany. I mean, obviously, Brussels is politically standing up to Silicon Valley. But I think it's wrong to... I'm always a bit wary of, 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 of having a book either bashing America or, or defending America. And I think that's not the kind of book I've written. Unfortunately, or in some ways, I guess, fortunately for me, often Europeans love my work because they see it as a critique of America. So my German, uh, my last book, The Internet's Not the Answer, which is, I think, a rather clever and sophisticated title, was translated into German as Der Digital Debacle. So, you know, the Germans, and, and Google is public enemy number one. And anytime uh -huh. you criticize Google in Germany, they love you. So um, you have to be a little careful. But in the book, I mean, Oakland, I, I spent some time with Frieda Kapoor Klein at Kapoor Capital, a very, very innovative new a uh, socially conscious venture capital firm in Oakland that's doing some really amazing things in terms of funding new innovation, new companies. I quote a number of innovative and, and I think socially responsible venture capitalists. John Borthwick in New York, where the book starts. Uh, Brad Burnham of Union Square Ventures. And I think there is a new consciousness. I mean, I wrote this slightly too late. I, I mentioned a guy called Tristan Harris, who has become the kind of voice of conscience in, in Silicon Valley. But there is the birth of a new movement in Silicon Valley, within Silicon Valley, to critique what's going on. Um, uh, uh, Tristan Harris is very prominent in this. Even some CEOs like Mark Benioff, the CEO of Salesforce, I mean, he's not a perfect person. There's no such thing, I think, as a, certainly a perfect CEO of a big tech company, a, a perfect multi-billionaire. But he has been very outspoken in the need for Silicon Valley companies uh, to, 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 to grow up. There's another guy called Roger McNamee, who was a very, uh, very prominent Silicon Valley venture capitalist as well as musician. He was a very early investor in Facebook. In fact, he became Mark Zuckerberg's mentor. Recently, he's come out very vocally about Facebook. He's written some op-eds in the, in the Washington Post and other places and said, look, this doesn't work anymore. It's addictive. It's destroying democracy. It's bad for our kids. It's bad for our society. So I wouldn't want this book or this conversation to turn into just an excuse of bashing Silicon Valley. I think that's rather boring and unfair. And to, to, to claim that, you know, there are some bad people in Silicon Valley. There are, some, there are some intellectually, I think, troubling people. Obviously, Peter Thiel comes to mind. There are some morally unscrupulous people like Travis Kalalnik, the ex-CEO of Uber. Uh, there is, I think, a, a rather misogynistic boys' club culture there. But even that now is being challenged. This week there's a new book out about that. So I think things will change. I think one of the encouraging things actually about Silicon Valley is there's a kind of new militancy or a new sort of militant class of female entrepreneurs who are very, very aggressive now in determining, in, in articulating their rights and their critique. And I hope that they will also begin to design better products, products which aren't just boys club products. And, and you suggest that they perhaps should be, could and should be forced to, and that if there's regulation of You mean the, forced, like put in prison if they don't do it? No, more like, the, I guess the industry as a whole, if there's regulation that, you know, like the, the um, I'm forgetting the name of it, the act that passed in Brussels that I think went to a, into effect at the top of this year. Right, right. Um, that basically, you know, returns the right of our data to ourselves, or at least EU Yeah, citizens. the GPR, I, I always get those. Oh. The, the, it's a General Data Protection Act that's right. just come into act. Look, I think these companies, particularly, f I mean, Apple, Apple is slightly different in it sells products. Mm -hmm. it, it, it's Amazon. not a big data yeah. company. 
Amazon's an interesting company, which, you know, is sort of, in a way, it's the most dangerous and the most interesting of all the companies, I think, around. And Jeff Bezos is certainly the, the man I both most fear and I have most hope in. I have a whole section mm. in the book about him. Um, but I think they have to be held accountable. I don't want to punish them because they're successful or rich. That's absurd and that's dangerous. But they have to be account held accountable as media companies. They are media companies. They have huge platforms. Something like Facebook has a huge platform which publishes stuff. They've always wanted to have a, their cake and eat it. They've always wanted to be a media company in the sense of publishing, of having all this content and monetizing it through advertising. But when it comes to taking responsibility, when people put up Nazi stuff or you know, hateful stuff against women or minorities or live beheadings, which would be illegal and punishable for a newspaper or a television station, because of the nature of certain sort of caveats in the law which emerged in the 90s to protect the internet, these internet businesses, they haven't been liable under the law. So I think they have to be accountable like any media company. They don't have to be more accountable. I don't see any reason to just pile in on them and find them for no reason. And I think some of the European reaction has been mm. rather infantile as well. I mean, as I say in the book, I mean, in France, which obviously tends to exaggerate some of this stuff. Um, you know, in France, they had a law where uh, if, if they wanted a law where if Google, Google News sent newspapers, readers, they would have to pay the newspapers. As if it's absurd. I mean, why would, why would Google News have to pay newspapers for sending them customers? So after that law was imposed, Google News shut down in France and Spain, and the newspapers obviously lost out on, on, on huge sources of revenue. So not all regulation is good. Some regulation is counterproductive. Some of it's just reactionary and badly thought out. But the best kind of innovation, the best kind of regulation is innovative, because the best kind of regulation creates a, a flatter playing field, which is good for entrepreneurs, which is good for innovation. So that's what Margaret Vestager is doing in Europe. When you're going up against, when you're using antitrust against these new, what Timothy Garton Ash, the Oxford historian, called private superpowers, that's in the interest of innovation. That's not against innovation. Um, and I think one of the problems in the US was that Obama, who I'm sure most of us like generally, I'm certainly an admirer of him, uh, particularly in contrast with the current president. But Obama was seduced by Silicon Valley. Si Obama fell into the trap of believing that technology in itself was somehow good and that Silicon Valley was a progressive engine. And he was very close in particular to Eric Schmidt, the uh, executive chairman of, of Google. When you look at the White House logs under Obama, I think uh, outside Obama's family and friends, uh, uh, Schmidt visited it more than anyone else. And I think Google and Facebook are now spending more money in Washington, D.C. as lobbyists than any other company, much more than AT&T and the telcos, much more than armament companies or, 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 or oil companies. So uh, the government, and, and, and I, I'm not a, as I'm sure most of you, I'm not a huge fan of Donald Trump to put it mildly, but he has said some interesting things and some people in his administration have said some interesting things about antitrust and the challenge of these companies. It's interesting that some of the stuff that Trump is saying about Silicon Valley is actually identical to what Elizabeth Warren and Bernie Sanders are saying. So you're seeing a new kind of consensus, a new kind of conversation under Obama. Nothing happened on the antitrust front, which was a disgrace because the Europeans are having to pioneer this and the real challenge and reform to American companies is gonna come from Europe, which I think is commendable from Europe's point of view, but also doesn't reflect well on, on American politics and American inability to curb monopolies. So we've talked a lot about uh, innovation and um about regulation. Um, what are, let's talk about some of the other uh, sort of pillars that you lay out in the book. Um, one of them was social responsibility, which we were talking about a little bit, but, but um, we didn't get to the part about 
you know, the way that, uh, you know, some of these, uh, the, the big players in tech the, have, have started, well, for a long time, time now, obviously, Gates has been giving away his, his mm. wealth or working on his pledge to give away all his wealth by the time he's left the earth, and, and now Zuckerberg's kind of doing Do you admire thing. him for that? Gates. Well, I don't know. I mean, your, your point is... Gates, was, I mean, you, you guys are in Seattle. Is he a good guy or not? I don't know. Maybe you can tell me, no? Yeah, I think some, the impression generally is that sometimes those efforts are... You like it? Let's have, a, let's have an audience, uh, some audience participation. Who here thinks, in overall terms, Gates is a good guy? So, pretty good. Anyone who, who doesn't? So, as a cameraman, doesn't count. <laughs> <laughs> and pay for his ticket. So he is pretty good. Yeah. But what it seems like you're saying is that in some sense they should be addressing the very ills that their, their companies are perpetrating. Yeah. That maybe they're off on the wrong I think there's path. a bit of a problem going on in Silicon Valley is that someone like Zuckerberg is an example. He has this sort of, everything is a, a kind of an arms race. You know, they want to have the biggest missiles, the biggest mm -hmm. cars, the biggest this, the biggest that. The biggest and some of them want to have the biggest philanthropic initiative. So there's this kind of arms race to give away your money. And Zuckerberg is a good example of the, I don't know about the hypocrisy, but the, there's a certain kind of dodginess about the whole thing. When you look at what Zuckerberg did with his foundation, he committed to give away all his money, I think 99% of it. But then when people looked at it carefully, it was a tax dodge. So we have to be a little a bit more critical just because you decide to give away. You know, when you're worth... 50, 100 billion dollars, as Jeff Bezos or, or Mark Zuckerberg is, um, ultimately you are going to give away your money because you can't spend it. Mm -hmm. I mean, however hard you try. Uh, I, I think you have a responsibility to, f I mean, I use the old General Colin Powell rule. I use Carnegie, by the way, as a model. I think we have to look back to the robber barons of the 19th century. Again, not ideal people sort of live split between being evil robber barons and being good philanthropists like Bill Gates. But Carnegie really it reinvested his wealth in society. Uh, and um, maybe even as a steel baron, his exploitation of the working class in a way he gave back with his commitment to libraries and his commitment to self-realization. I think with Amazon, um, Bezos, I think Amazon, more than anything else, is changing the nature of work in this country in a number of different ways. Firstly, it's decimated retail. And I think retail was one of the core underpinnings of a middle-class economy. When you go to most parts of America, maybe outside places like Seattle and San Francisco, malls have been utterly destroyed. No one goes to malls anymore. Everyone shops on Amazon. Um, and it's undermined a certain way of working. I think he's pioneering a new kind of surveillance style capitalism with his distribution centers. Anyone here who works for Amazon, maybe you have to be careful about what I say. <laughs> um, and also, of course, he's pioneering AI. He's pioneering drone delivery, and ultimately, I think he'd like to automate much of the work process. So what I would like to see with Amazon and Bezos, who I think is a responsible citizen, I think his investment in the Washington Post, and many of the things he says makes him much more of a grown-up than some of the others. I think Zuckerberg is a little bit of a clown in mm -hmm. his idealism. He's drunk the Kool-Aid. He's still a kid, and I'm not sure if he'll ever grow up. I think Bezos never really drank any Kool-Aid. He's a really smart, really articulate person. I've met him a few times, I've seen him in action, and he's very, very smart. I think he has a responsibility to invest his wealth in... Um, in, um, in, in looking at the future of work. One of the greatest challenges on the horizon, given AI, given smart machines, given how our society is about to be really radically transformed by, by, by this intelligent technology, is what we're gonna do, how we're gonna work, what kind of education establishments are gonna exist, how we should be trained, what are the focuses of education. If we're, you know, if we're not gonna be engineers and doctors and lawyers because machines do that, if we're not going to be drivers, if we're not going to be fast food uh, restaurant people, if, 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 if algorithms do all that, then what are we going to do? I think Bezos has a responsibility as one of the, the major pioneers of this new economy in broad terms to figure out what we're going to do, whether he wants to champion minimum guaranteed income, where I have a section in the book, 
or whether he wants to rethink social policy or taxation. Something has to be done. These are huge issues. You can't create an app to fix that. You can't have it fixed by drone delivery or, you know, $100 a year services so you get everything delivered for free. Um, this, uh, this is a massive problem, as big a problem in, in some ways as, as we've ever created as a species. You know, Gates believes, and Elon Musk believes, that these machines will acquire consciousness and come to enslave us. So not only are they, is AI our greatest invention, some people believe it'll be our last invention. And if that's really the case, then someone like Bezos should be investing his enormous wealth and intelligence in figuring out what we're going to do. It's all about agency. The key word in my book, by the way, is agency. We need to display that agency. Computers or smart machines, the digital revolution, has undermined much of our agency. We're creating machines that do much of what we do. So the great crisis and challenge of of what it means to be human. In, 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 a, in the UK, the subtitle of the book is How to Be Human in the Digital Age. The great challenge and opportunity is to display that agency. I even come up with a, a term for it. You know, the, there's a, a Moore's Law, Gordon Moore's Law, which is the engine of the digital economy. I come up with another Moore's Law, this one derived from Thomas More, the uh, author of Utopia, the 16th century book. Uh, utopia is an important theme in the book. And in Utopia, I argue, Moore tells people the real message in Moore's Utopia is to articulate agency. That's what will make the world a better place. Things haven't changed between the 16th century and today. 500 years, the story is still the same. We need to make our own world rather than have that world make us. And if anything, the, you know, the disruption and uncertainty and vertigo of the 16th century now are being replicated in the early part of the 21st century. So agency is really important. You've got to, you know, and, and, and these tech entrepreneurs and billionaires need to take responsibility themselves. Zuckerberg should be taking real responsibility for fake news, not just giving away his billions kind of in an arbitrary way to show off, but he should be addressing this issue. He could be putting 10, 20 billion dollars into that which would really address the issue rather than just sort of frittering away his money on uh, uh, science. He, he now has this idea, well, I'm going to solve illness, which is an, an absurd Silicon Valley conceit. The idea of, you know, just as you have people now who think the Peter Thiels and the Ray Kurzweils of the world who think we can live forever. These people have to come down to earth. They have to become accountable. Um, and they need to use the models of people like Carnegie and maybe Gates, who I think is a good model, a responsible citizen, of re not only reinvesting his wealth in society, but doing it consciously, doing it in a way that he has become accountable. So you break it, you fix it. Um, and there are models in, in Silicon Valley. Uh, Benioff, I think, is an interesting case. The smaller cases like Craig Newmark, the founder of Craigslist, he, his, the unintended consequence of Craigslist was he destroyed local journalism because he disintermediated advertising and made their business models harder and harder. He didn't want to do it. He did it by accident. Once he realized what he did, he spent much of his life actually trying to finance ways of reinventing business models for journalism. So there are models. And I think it would be wrong to, you know, with one brushstroke, vilify all these Silicon Valley entrepreneurs. They're not all... Travis Kalalnik or Mark Zuckerberg, they're all different. Uh, Musk is also an interesting character. In some ways, very much committed to the public good in his concern about environmentalism, but also kind of living in another universe. The recent thing about sending up a Tesla car and his rocket speaks of the way in which kind of public service, if you like, or uh, has been privatized, where these people are behaving like the state. The original American space enterprise was financed by NASA. It was a state enterprise, a collective one on our behalf. These entrepreneurs are so wealthy now that they are trying to colonize space, which is very troubling in some ways. And, and there's no coherence to it. Why? Are they trying to settle on Mars? Is it some sort of commercial endeavor to create an interplanetary transportation system? Or is there something more serious about it? Well, and it's, it's interesting that the gap between, um, you know, all of the efficiencies being created by mechanization and technology 
that we haven't really seen those lead to, you know, some of the, the sort of more as utopia kind of, kind of things like uh, the, the six hour workday or whatever it was, mm. all of our lives getting easier. It seems like we're just working just as hard and maybe even uh, with, with fewer benefits and um, working in the, the gig economy and stuff like that, like you talk about in the book. Um, so but I do, you know, I think we do have to take supposedly utopian ideas like the guaranteed minimum income seriously. Mm -hmm. In the book um, on minimum guaranteed income, I interview uh, the Swiss guy who pioneered the first referendum uh, on whether or not the Swiss should adapt guaranteed minimum income. It lost, but it was a serious issue which Swiss people voted on. Uh, all around the world, people are looking at this seriously, uh, from Finland, Brazil, Estonia, Switzerland, um, Holland, uh, Singapore are looking at it. So I, I think these are issues. We're living in radically disruptive times. One of the problems is our politics isn't able to keep up. Mm -hmm. So we're falling back on traditional solutions, whether they're free market solutions, which have clearly failed, or regulatory solutions, which are also in themselves don't work. Uh, and in, in fact, you could argue, as I indeed do in the book, is the problem with the Silicon Valley experiment, the reason it went wrong was that it has become just a purely free market business. And it, we were told that the free market would create competitiveness and uh, collective wealth, and of course that's not true. When the market is not, is completely unregulated, as for the most part the Silicon Valley market has become, it becomes a winner-take-all economy and you have the emergence of monopolists and tiny clusters of enormously powerful and wealthy people who have no real responsibility towards society. So speaking of agency that you were talking about before, before we go to, to Q&A, um, let's talk about what we can do for ourselves. Um, you have children, right? Um, yeah. What, what are the skills that, that you want your children learning so that they're ready for the new economy that we're, we're looking for? Well, that's a good to. question. Um, I, the, the final chapter in the book is on education, and I don't, you know, some of you may have read some of my other books. I, I try not to write too much about myself, because firstly, I don't think I have a very interesting life. Uh, and secondly, it's just, I'm sort of slightly awkward doing it. But in this book, I do write about my kids' education. My uh, ex-wife actually is a very much committed to Waldorf education. Some of you may know what Waldorf is, which is a, uh, an educational movement founded by Rudolf Steiner, a German-Austrian philosopher at the beginning of the 20th century, which focused, if you like, on the development of the muscle of agency focused on teaching kids to be creative, focused on what it means to be educating people and what it means to be human. Um, and it's interesting that Waldorf schools have, ironically, and this is rather chilling, I guess, in a way, have become very, very popular in Silicon Valley. The most successful Waldorf primary school, I think, is in Mountain View, where all the senior executives of Google and Facebook send their kids. So their kids the, aren't learning to code. Well, the, not only are they not turning to code, but the point of early Waldorf education is that screens aren't allowed. Um, and that the, the, the principle is that technology doesn't teach kids to be creative, and so they focus on inter, into human skills. So I have a little bit of a, a story about that, about my kids. It doesn't always work. My son didn't like it and left and had a more traditional education. My daughter has embraced it. I think the important thing to remind ourselves, though, is one of the one of the kind of truisms of today's tech-saturated world is that kids should learn coding. Kids should become literate in, 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 in the algorithm or in creating code, uh, in programming. I'm not convinced that's wise because I think the very smart machines and smart algorithms we're creating can essentially replicate most programming. I'm not sure if there's going to be much of a human role, or there isn't going to be much of a role for most humans in the future of computing and in programming. What computers can't do, and this is the core message in the book, which is also bound up in agency, computers don't have agency. They never will have. I, I quote um, uh, the, uh, I've forgotten her name, the, uh, the founder of the, the uh, a woman called um, Lovelace. Um, oh, Ada Lovelace. Yeah. Ada Lovelace, who was the daughter of Lord Byron, who, who was the inventor of computer software. She is indeed probably the father, or perhaps more appropriately, the mother of all computers. She was the 
business partner of Charles Babbage, who invented the first analog computer. But she was much more of a visionary, much smarter than him. And she famously says, and I quote her, I can't quote the book here, that computers will never learn to think for themselves. They'll never have agency. And that's the point about the digital century, is that computers will do many things, but they won't have agency. They can't be creative. They won't write chapters in books. Um, they can't empathize. They can't develop the kind of intricate skills of human consciousness that have shaped um, our narrative as, as a species. And I think that's the thing we need to concentrate on. Uh, the the top-down nature of education in the industrial age was trying to make us into computers, for better or worse, sometimes successfully, sometimes, I guess, in an existential way, very troubling. But we no longer need to do that. So we need to focus on empathy, on creativity, on the very skills that places like Waldorf schools or Montessori schools are, are trying to bring out. We're seeing it at the university level as well. In Singapore, I visited a, a university and engineering school in which humanities was central or becoming central. Now, I'm not saying everyone should just, you know, it's boring to say, oh, well, everyone should read Prato and Aristotle and Machiavelli and Rousseau, and that will solve all our problems. That's a rather boring argument. But what is true is that uh, engineering schools should integrate the humanities, just as humanities schools should integrate engineering. And we need to radically rethink education. I think whilst education, it's always easy to talk about education because it's so abstract and big. And the bigger the problem, the more obvious it becomes solved with education. So I always make a joke when we have these kind of conversations. At the end of the conversation, people say, well, it's always the solution is education. We always come up with that solution because we don't know how to fix it. So we dump it into the bucket of education. I'm sure some of you are teachers. You know how hard it is to run a school. You know how underpaid and under-respected teachers are in this culture anyway. So I'm not saying everything is education, but I am saying that the, the skills we need to teach our kids, that creativity, that flexibility, that ability to, re to invent and reinvent themselves is critical. Uh, you know, we in my generation had one job in our lives. My kids' generation have six jobs. Their kids will have six jobs simultaneously. And to do that, you need to be flexible. You need to be able to invent and reinvent yourself. It doesn't mean everyone becomes entrepreneurs, but certainly that flexibility, that ability to disrupt oneself, which is the feature of successful entrepreneurs, is something that we need to teach kids. So uh, we need it. Uh, it's, 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 the challenges are immense, but they're also very exciting. You know, people often talk about this second renaissance. It could be a second renaissance if we do it right. So my book is an attempt to start that conversation. I'm not promising anything. I'm not in the Silicon Valley business of selling false utopias. Uh, but the opportunity is enormous if we do it right. But if we do it wrong, we really might find ourselves in, in a dystopian world of enormously powerful tech companies, joblessness, increasingly radical inequality, uh, and a world which um, we will, I think, shamefully leave to our, to our kids. So it's up to us. Can't blame the tech companies. The future is in our hands, nobody else's. Certainly the book left me both nervous, to, to say the least, but Good also nerves. hopeful. Hopeful, hopeful. About Well, about yeah, it's, uh, it should make, it's designed to make. I mean, a good book, sh uh, hopefully it's a good book, Good books should make you nervous, should be challenging. I mean, I'm not coming up with dumb solutions. I mean, <laughs> the, the problem with a lot of these tech books is they treat people like they're idiots. And they say, well, you know, all we need is blockchain and that solves everything. All we need is the internet and that solves everything. And it's, it's such a childish delusion. And it treats its readers and users as if they're just idiots. And we, the reader in a book is key. I mean, you're, you're not just telling someone something, you're imploring them. It's a call to arms. I was going to make you actually explain blockchain, but I think this is probably mm. a good time to, to shift to um, good, thank questions you. from the audience, and then somebody else can ask you that. So. I have a question about agency. You know, agency is supposed to be the foundation of a democratic system. And when we see more and more this kind of psychographic targeting and the ability, like Cambridge Analytics, I think it was yeah. called, talking about how they can predict our decisions better than we can predict them ourselves. Like, what is the role of agency then in a democratic system, and what how, what role would that play in our ability to create solutions if we 
are subject to this vulnerability of having our choices influenced and maybe steered for us and our agency kind of undermined? Well, that's an interesting question. So you're saying that agency is being captured by tech. Is that your question? Yeah. Well, yeah, that, 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 that is a great question. It's, it's, it's an, a very, very important question. And I think that's where perhaps regulation is important because the reform, the G GPRE reform in Europe, is an attempt to reinvent data. I mean, the only reason Cambridge Analytics is able to, to, to and, and companies like that are able to essentially appropriate our agency is because all our data is public and they've collected all that data, and they've determined what we're going to do. The point about data reform is giving the data back to us. It, 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 it creates what's called data portability, so that we can protect our data, we can take it with us, we know who's, most of us, in you, you, the savvy consumer question, you know, you have no idea what the, Google's doing with your data. I have absolutely no idea, and there are no laws, no rules about it. So we need regulation, we need laws to make sure that our data doesn't just exist out there and that unscrupulous companies like C Cambridge Analytics are using it firstly to exploit us and even undermine our agency. So I think it's a really important question. And, and you're right, it, it's not easy. An agency is a kind of sexy word and I, I hope some of you will read the book. I'm not treating it in a gung-ho, simplistic fashion. It's a complicated word, it's, um, uh, but at the same time, uh, the issue of agency is key because, you know, countries like China, t t authoritarian, I might even argue totalitarian countries like China, are using technology to really undermine agency. So I saw a headline in the newspaper today in which Chinese police are using facial recognition technology. And this issue is going to become even more paramount with new technologies, facial recognition technologies that will allow, will allow people to determine people's sexuality. Um, uh, so this is a huge, complicated, but extremely important question. And, and you're right to be so concerned about it. Yeah, I wonder if you could elaborate a little bit on that Tim Berners-Lee idea of re-decentralization, if there's any like if you or him or other people have ideas or initiatives that are like in the works and especially like what like a citizen activist could do to get on board with something like that or, or what's going on in that world if anything? Well, as I have a whole chapter on it. There's a Berlin-based venture capital company called Blue Yard Capital. I'm actually going back in um, March to speak at their conference. They're investing massively in decentralized networks uh, that will, as I said, it, it's the opposite. It, it's networks where there is no middleman, no rentier. And this may be the next sort of wave of innovation. Blockchain is also an interesting technology which can be used in this way. So there's lots of examples in the book. But this is exciting. Uh, uh, there's a, the organizations are called DAO, Decentralized Autonomous Organizations. I think that's what they stand for. So there's a lot of stuff going on in this area. I think we have to be careful not, though, to be seduced by the utopian promises of technology. One of the things that's kind of interesting is what happens when one of these companies becomes dominant in, in the new kind of uh, competitive environment? Will they turn into the next Google or Facebook? If a decentralized network becomes a winner-take-all decentralized network, how are they different from Microsoft or, or Apple? Uh, so that's a really interesting question. But it, it is an exciting development. You're right about citizens' groups. Those have always been. And I, and I think we're seeing, in political terms, some of the more hopeful developments are, you know, the, the, the Black Lives Matter movement, the, uh, the movement against uh, sexual harassment. These are coming from the edge. What's problematic, say, with the, the Me Too movement is that much of the research on it was done by serious newspapers like the New York Times that started the whole thing with their investigation of Weinstein and it sort of degenerated in social media. So just because they're decentralized doesn't mean you're always going to have a civil discussion. 
We have to grow up ourselves. We can't rely on technology. But there's certainly a huge opportunity there, I think. It's an exciting moment. One venture capitalist in the book I quote says, it's like 1995 all over again. Now, the original 1995 didn't work out so well, but maybe when we get back, if we can do 1995 all over again, it will be better. Berners-Lee is championing this actively, both in terms of demands for regulation of the internet and the web, but also of championing and investing in startups himself. It's no coincidence that the decentralized, the re-decentralized event that I narrate, that I describe in the book, in, in the Berlin chapter, in the beginning of the book, uh, this, the next week there was a similar event in San Francisco. So, as always, when you think you have an original idea, it's an idea that's occurred to many, many different people at the same time. So this is the new, new thing in Silicon Valley, are these, not only in Silicon Valley, but in Germany and on the, on the, on the East Coast, are these decentralized networks which offer interesting business opportunities to connect consumers and, 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 and manufacturers. Uh, you also see it in the, in the creative community. You see it, I mean, obviously you have subscription models like um, uh, Spotify, which are interesting in some ways, but you have it with a network like pa Patreon. Some of you may know this. Patreon is a new kind of decentralized network that allows artists and their followers to directly connect and do business with one another. You don't, I mean, Patreon is a kind of middleman, but it's a different kind of middleman to Uber or Airbnb or YouTube. So there's lots of examples. Thanks. Uh, you mentioned earlier about some kind of catastrophe that might bring about the change. Yeah. Exxon Valdez. What do you think that might look like? Um, yeah, and that's something that's come up quite a lot. In, you know, I've mm. been on tour now for a week, and it's a question that's come up in lots of different ways. I mean, I, I don't celebrate this, of course. I think it, you know, catastrophes are disasters. But there's a, I can't remember the name of the book, but someone, a German historian just wrote a book in which he analyzed societies which suffered massive inequality. And um, the only way those in, that inequality ever changed was through war or revolution. So the catastrophe may come through war or revolution. Uh, and I think the war will be driven by data. I think that you're going to have increasingly global international relations being determined by data politics. And much of the warfare will become data-based. There's a friend of mine called David Kirkpatrick. He's a very distinguished tech journalist. Uh, he wrote the best book on Facebook, um, was or editor of Fortune for years. I saw him a few weeks ago. He said to me that, there's all these rumors, and he's not some sort of paranoid lunatic, this guy. He said there's all these rumors that what the Chinese government are planning to do is, take, is, is, is essentially stealing the data of all of, of, of everyone in America. Now, that might sound obviously paranoid and anti-Chinese, whether or not it's true. But one could imagine pirate governments, certainly in, the Soviet, in, in Russia, uh, using data to make war on other countries. You also have the first real data war was one between Russia and Estonia. It's called the first digital world war. So I, I think on the international relations warfare front, it's likely that there will be some sort of catastrophe. I also think that there will be massive hacking. Uh, there will be a massive hacking event that will wake up Consumers who think savvy like, consumers like savvy him. consumers like him. Uh, well, and you know, whether it's Google who gets hacked or Facebook or the US government, something will happen on the data front. That it will be like Chernobyl. Uh, it will suddenly, people will think, oh my God, I never realized. And you know, most people are lazy. They don't want it. They've got their own daily concerns. But when something massive happens like that, you know, if I knew, obviously, I, firstly, I wouldn't tell you and, uh, because I'd be investing in it somehow. Uh, but uh, if I, you know, I don't know any more than you, but I, I, I expect something dramatic will happen, very dramatic, in the, in the, in the not-too-distant future. So you just mentioned data wars. I'm curious, what, what is a war and how do you use a data war? Well, what happened between Russia and Estonia, for example, is Russia essentially hijacked Estonian data, uh, digital infrastructure. And 
bombed their network to, to, to take it over. Right. So you, that's, uh, I mean, obviously you can hack the American arsenal. Right. You can, because everything is so digitally dependent, everything is hackable. And then imagine what would happen. Now, I mean, some of this stuff can be over-dramatized and turned into a kind of Hollywood movie. But I, I think some of it is, is not unrealistic. Well, when you talk about in the book that, the, you know, we're all paranoid about the sort of NSA surveillance and, and that right. kind of thing, but it's actually not the, the secrecy of the data, but the, the integrity of the data. And if you can go in, and I think the example you used is manipulating yeah. somebody's blood type in, in all of the, their health records, then yeah. all of a sudden you've... Right. I, in, a, in, a, in my Estonian chapter, and again, trying to be more positive rather than dystopian and fearful of the future. What the Estonians are doing is shaping a new kind of social contract in the big data age, where the Estonians are the most advanced country when it comes to e-government and the collection and development and of, 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 of digital and data uh, in, in, in between citizens and government. So, but what they're doing is creating with their initiatives a new kind of contract where um, the government has access to everyone's data, but has no right to look at that data unless they uh, inform the citizen. So I, I think it, it, it's, it's a different kind of relationship on privacy from the industrial one of the 19th century where we could actively protect our privacy. So the, Aston the Estonians are pioneers in this sense. It's very interesting what they're doing and it's being copied by other governments. And, you know, the, the dark side, as I said, is China, yeah. which are, w in, in which they've not only collected everyone's data, but then determining people's fate according to their political correctness, their at least from the point of view of the regime. So it's, yeah. yeah. Yeah, the Chinese example is actually really scary for the racial implications of that as well, uh, looking at. But my question is having to do with agency and uh, civic participation. So how do citizens who are working nine to five or whatever hours people work compete with trying to express their agency with people who are paid to work hours to counteract that, thinking like Russian fake news trolls or tech companies that are paying people to, say, lobby governments? How do you compete and organize together to work with that in the digital age? Uh, well, I think you can as citizens. You can create, you know, the, the Me Too movement, the Black Lives Matter movement. Absolutely. I mean, why? why I, I, I think you, you can actively compete. The question is how you do it, whether you use technology. I think one of the delusions was, you know, we could just use Facebook and Google, uh, Facebook and Twitter, and we could change the world, and that, that, that was proven wrong during the Arab Spring in particular. Yeah. Can't rely on technology, but citizens throughout history have always been empowered to change their own circumstances. I think we shouldn't exaggerate the power of technology, but when there are desires, movements, groups of people, and it's extremely valuable. I think one of the challenges is escaping social media. The problem with social media is that it's extremely narcissistic. It's isolating us from other people. It's created a kind of echo chamber culture. We're failing to actually talk to one another, and one of the reasons for that is social media. So it might be that for real citizen engagement, the manifestation of a sort of collective agency in this world, we need to escape social media and have physical meetings. I think one of my hopes, actually, of the so-called digital generation, uh, digital natives, is the, what one author called the revenge of analog. I think the real value in, in, in the digital world, in commercial and intellectual terms, is physical interaction. So rather than relying on the internet for citizen activism. I think people need to start meeting again physically. Thank you. Um, so I appreciated your comment about um, uh, in humanities and engineering um, becoming more unified. Um, as someone from a predominantly humanities background, I'm now coming into a new job position where I'm uh, trying to ramp up as quickly as I can on uh, using uh, coding uh, in Python to access uh, social media APIs. 
and uh, so that I can therefore collect data uh, about audience uh, analytics, about people, uh, which is an empowering um, skill set, I, I actually, I, I think, and um, interesting in that regard. And part of what I'm looking for and asking questions about is who are the uh, major social media influencers um, who it turns out there are these uh, people who have figured out how to use their uh, social media personality to basically make a living mm -hmm. getting sponsored to be themselves. And um, yeah. like uh, it's, it's kind of a dream of a lot of people that I know is to just kind of quit their jobs and become YouTube stars or um, bloggers yeah. or podcasters or what have you, um, which is also an empowering age, source of agency. So I'm just curious about your thoughts uh, on that. Um, well, I think, uh, it's, uh, it, it usually, does, I mean, the idea of quitting your job and becoming a YouTube star is like winning the lottery. Uh, that was, that's an argument I've been making for the last 10 years, is the internet hasn't really democratized culture. It's given everyone, I guess, a, a soapbox, a voice, but it's, it's created a cacophonous culture, and it, it's much tougher now to make it as a video star or a music star on these networks than it was on curated media. So for those people who think they can make it on YouTube, think again. I mean, you're better off buying a lottery ticket. And, and, and we still need curators. We still need tastemakers. Um, I think that's the thing that we can't lose. Um, and, and one of the problems, I think, also in cultural terms with YouTube stars is that the, the level of inanity of some of them is really shocking. So the quality, the, 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 the taste issue is still relevant. But, you know, that's another, another Well, I would, I would just uh, question that uh, a lot of social media influencers are those taste makers, in fact. Right. Mm. Uh, and that's how they make their living. So Twitter, yeah. for example. Well, they, they want to have their cake and eat it, which is, yeah. you know. What do you and, do then and then there's them? no real accountability on some of these social media influencers. Uh, and uh, so, yeah, so it, but, it, but they are interesting. And, and, you know, coming back to the question before, the social media influencers can be the ones leading these new citizen movements if they behave responsibly and accountably. So I think these people have responsibility as well. And uh, uh, hopefully they will also grow up. Do we have one more question? Yeah. This might be a little bit too specific, but um, in your research, you run a, you've heard the terms Tor, Tails, Linux. I say that again. Tor, Tails, Linux, programming. Yeah. Have you heard of anything else that might be a good defense against Google, Amazon, and the rest of them? Well, I think that, you know, again, coming back to these decentralized networks, I think blockchain is interesting in, in mm. that sense. But I, I think. We can't, there aren't technological solutions to the problems of technology. We've always well, that's been, what I'm thinking. Well, I mean, yeah, they're, they're, so we had a whole generation that obsessed over open source. But what has come out of open source are monopolistic companies. It, it doesn't seem to have resided. It's like, you know, free content. Everyone idealized free content, uh, the technology, and it destroyed newspapers and created, you know, a few dominant tech players in, 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 in the creative industry. Um, so I would, I, I think that's a, 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 an unhealthy way of looking at it, saying, well, there's going to be a new platform. Um, th that's always the thing that offers promise, but it always lets us down. There's always technology, that the, the solution to our, you know, we live in an age in which technology has essentially conquered the world. The solution to that is not more technology or even new technology. It, the solution is us mastering the world, not crushing technology, not becoming Luddites, but shaping it according to our own interests, not inventing a new technology that can solve technology problems. No, it's more that, defense than anything else. Well, but I think the defense will come from us as human beings, not from technology. I mean, obviously, technology is important. Um, but the solution to fake news, for example, is not more technology, 
the, 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 the solution to fake news is, is human create, curators. It's having editors or, 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 or new kinds of editors that can check the veracity of information. You can't have an algorithm to check that. And one of the problems with always relying on technology when it comes back to the job issue anyway is you're making us redundant. So I, I would much prefer to think of human solutions to these problems than technological ones. Mm. I think that's a great place to, to end. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. Andrew. So I've the book.